episode five. So, deloading in the classic West Side Barbell conjugate system. Now, if any of you know anything about the classic West Side Barbell conjugate system, not what some offshoot created, called it conjugate something, the actual classical conjugate system by Louis Simmons, you will know that title's a bit of clickbait because there is no technical deload. Now, when I said technical deload, what I'm saying is if you look at virtually any other program out there, you'll see it is linear progression. It ramps up, 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 up to the contest date or the season, and then it, it radically drops, whether that's in, in frequency, volume, intensity, load, however you're going to describe it, is a radical drop off. Now, it's important to understand why, as an athlete or a lifter, do you need to deload or do programs deload? The only reason why you would deload is if you are, in fact, not recovering. You're not taking enough days of rest. You're not fueling yourself. You're not controlling your stress. You're not sleeping. You're not hydrating. There is an element that is too intense for your body. So you are, in fact, overtraining, and then you need to drop off to regroup, to rebound. Now, there is a technical term for this, and that's called overreaching. Overreaching essentially is, again, driving your body over and above 100% intensity for longer than it is needed to, to have the body super compensate for whatever it is you're doing. So if you look at the classical West Side Barbell circa max, three weeks out, you're taking a heinously big squat against a large amount of bands, usually about 440 pounds of bands for one rep max. That is so far well and beyond what your nervous system is capable of, and that's why it was two weeks there is a slight drop before a super compensation rebound. However, that's not technically a deload. That's not technically a, what I call a reload, because it, just because some athletes mentally, we tell them to deload, they freak out and think, oh my God, I'm gonna be doing less and less and less. If I tell them reload, you're not taking bullets out of your gun, I'm putting bullets back in my gun to go hunting. So if you change that verbiage a little bit for your athletes, that will take care of that apprehension. I digress, moving on. So. Why do we really need to deload, all right? And why do we necessarily have to drop percentage, volume, load, or intensity? You, you really don't so much. So as a strength and conditioning coach, you need to be a fan of all realms. So just harken back, way back to the 70s and 80s to a guy named Mike Menser, who was a very large proponent of incredibly high intensity training to a point where you're only training once every seven to 10 days. Think about that for a second. Each training session only lasted 30 minutes. Granted, it was for hypertrophy. However, with the intense weights they're using, six to 10 rep range, they're gonna build strength regardless. However, Mike Menser once said, well, the only need to deload, much like I've already mentioned, is if you are overtraining. So if you look at the classical Westside Barbell's conjugate system by Louis Simmons, you will see you're constantly training at or above 90%. So if you're constantly fluttering there, we're not touching 100 or going 110, at least on a regular basis, you're constantly fluttering up high enough to be ready for a competition in three weeks' notice. Now this 90% intensity can be varied in different ways. I know a lot of fans are, uh, people, excuse me, people are fans of RPE, or the rate of perceived exertion. If I tell someone eight to nine RPE, rate of perceived exertion, you're essentially telling them to do 80 to 90%. That's what you're saying but that gives you a bit, bit of auto-regulation. If you're telling an athlete, hey, I want you to do between three to six reps, if they're feeling good, auto-regulating, they're gonna do around three. If they're feeling a little less than, they're gonna go up towards the six. You can tell them, hey, I want it for quality. All right, well, you don't want, you want it for quality, that helps really take it down if they're very, very intense, just individuals in general. They like the high-intensity style, they like pushing, especially on max effort days or heavy days, however you describe it. Absolutely, tell them to go for quality. That's going to help take them at 90, maybe down to 85 or 80 percent, and that way they're not overshooting. Now, let's say we're just running a classical West Side template. So, Monday, Wednesday, max effort, you're doing one rep maxes. Friday, Saturday, dynamic effort and a lot of volume. Appropriate volume, but a lot of volume nonetheless. So, when we look at this template, you have to understand a lot of it is dictated by how mature the athlete is. When lifters or athletes came to Westside, come to Westside, they're already 
there. And they're just looking for that last little bit of edge, last little bit of either intensity or movements they've never done to help spark an adaptation. So really how training mature you are and how much you understand, or as a coach, you understand how to cut someone off when it starts to go overboard, that's gonna keep them from overtraining. A prime example would be if someone is pulling, conventional or sumo, and hey, either way, let's say whatever deadlift you like, they're pulling, and they get to, let's pull this number out of my high knee, 495, so five plates, and they get there, and you notice they're losing their lats, their upper back is, is rounding, more so than just getting slack out of the bar. Stop, tell them, hey, we're gonna go from five plates, we're gonna add five pounds of that. That's it, very, very small jump. You tell them, you can't correct this, that, that back, your thoracic pushing your sternum forward and up, pressing the shoulders down, keep the lats in control, then we're done. If they can adjust it, if you see the training maturity there, they can keep going. If they don't, you can cut it, and then the one before that five plates that look good, that's their one rep. So, what does it look like when you notice your athlete, or as a coach yourself, like this is, this is feeling rough? Perhaps, you know, the athletes wake me up and they're telling me, oh, I feel heavy today. That 135 feels heavy, this athlete had activated, primed, warmed up, whatever Instagram term you like using today. It's all heavy. They're not getting enough sleep. You can see the bags under their eyes. That heavy bag under their eyes is very, very common in top end crossfitters because they're just beating themselves down year in, year out. You'll notice the bags under their eyes. And you can just see it in the way they move. They just move they're sluggish and they're not springy. When you have an athlete coming in saying they feel like a spring, they feel really good, and powerful, and everything's contracting hard, they're on the right path. Whether it's in their world or what you're programming them. But if they're not, they're feeling heavy, they're not feeling good, all right. In my mind, what I've seen at Westside, what I've done, I've helped do collegiately, what I've done in the tactical sector, what I do here at Industry Gym, one of three ways. And each of these three ways I will list down each week individually in the bottom description. You can scroll down, snap it, and move on. You don't need to watch the, watch the rest of the video. If you do want all the little fine nuances, keep watching. So, three ways of doing this. Number one way, this is a pure Westside barbell way. Chuck Vogelpohl was really big into this. Burley Hoff was really big into this. And that is, when you go into a week of a deload or a week of, I just need to get weight out of my hands or off a normal squatting or hinging pattern, really, really big on good mornings. Really, naturally, any bar. I would venture to say, whenever I watched Chuck, Burley, even Jake Anderson go through these periods, they love the giant camber bar. It, did, it does give you that understanding of where the straight bar is on, the, on your back, and then it swoops down deep to swivel so you can have great activation. You can really press your shoulder all the way down, you can drag it, activate your lat, you can actually guide where that's going to be, whether it's going to be more upper back when you push it forward, or more of the hinge into the hips, glutes, low back, upper thighs, if you retract it with that low trap and pull it back. So they would do a good morning. This good morning, I have seen people do it for one rep back in the, I say the day, 2012 to 2015, a lot of times they do good mornings, they would do it with a safety, this, the old safety spot bar, not the new age safety spot bar, the old safety spot bar, you'll see in videos, it's, it's like, it's got yellow tape on it, it's actually tilted like 15 degrees in the wrong direction, so a lot of people lose, lose sight because it presses in on their C7 through C5, they black out, so they would do a one rep with that, or like the standard bow bar. Bow bar or the old like Iron Mines Buffalo bar that we have down there. And they'd do that with front bands, 401. Now, as time went on, Chuck came back and like Brother was training with him and Jake was training with him. I noticed that Chuck was really, really big into good mornings. Now, that wasn't just for deloading, that was for everything. He was really big to jitsu at that point as well. So that, of course, plays a part in it. However, when we're talking about doing good morning for reps versus a one rep, we are talking about a very auto-regulated posterior chain builder. And for athletics in general, which is going to help the hinge, it's going to help the squat, depending on how you execute it, it's going to help the dead stop out of the bottom, it's going to help the bound in that hinge for a broad or a vertical jump. If you're into athletics as a coach, the conjugate system, massive, massive turnover. There are coaches I know that almost run good mornings as their primary max effort lift, whether you're talking about reps or ones for anywhere from two to four weeks, and they'll do like a squat and a traditional pull for two weeks. 
So, but the majority of it bargained for it. So, going back to how they would do it, three to six reps, usually a giant Cambridge bar. A lot of times, so it would translate over to the deadlift, it would be done concentrically out of the chain. So sometimes they would load their quads with the first one up, almost like squat it up. So you get like a little Anderson squat in there, and then you hinge back into it, good pause in the chain, concentrically come out of it for three, six reps. Sometimes it would be a dead stop from a hinge, which the weight at that point might be lower a little bit, but everything is relative. So if you are pushing yourself, it's gonna feel like 100%, that intensity is going to be there. A great quote I remember Louie telling me, and I'm sure he's told many people this, I'm sure you've heard this as well, if you're in an alley and you get the shit beat out of you by a 10 year old girl, your body doesn't know it's a 10 year old girl. It just knows you got the shit beat out of itself. That's it. So whether you're hinging out of the bottom or you're using your quads, everything is gonna be relative to that point. So they do three to six reps, and then they would go on to their auxiliaries. This could really be a myriad of anything. Really the only thing that was standard was that group one. And you know, take it for what's worth, I've watched a lot of these sessions that they did, many different ways. Again, you're constantly trying to figure out what's the best for you, so you're constantly tweaking that lift, constantly tweaking what you're doing on the back end. So, from my perspective, after you do something like that, the three to six reps, good morning with a giant Cambridge bar, let's say, you go into a belt squat, I know it sounds like a broken record, probably just a march. Because again, if we are trying to deload or reload, we're trying to take that spinal compression out. So just by wearing that belt, we're going to traction the lower spine, the lumbar area, strengthen the hips and the glutes, especially the glute need and the glute min, which helps stabilize. So the more those glute need and glute min are getting stronger and stronger, the more ability you're going to be able to stabilize in the squat and fill your glutes out the bottom of the hole. If you spend nothing with any athlete, which is working their glute min and glute need, about month three, they're going to tell you out of nowhere, without you prompting them, they feel their glutes more out of the hole. That's exactly what you want to hear, and that's when you know it's time to start translating into just pure glute max exercises. So you do that, the auxiliary one, auxiliary two, a hamstring. Again, because this is a deload reload scenario, probably a banded, something banded. Anywhere from three to five sets, 30 to 50 reps. Again, these 30 to 50 reps, they're in a row. You're not breaking them up. You're doing them in a row to get past that 30, maybe 40 rep threshold to start getting into the tens of ligaments, start pushing fresh blood in there and nutrients. So that'd be your second auxiliary. Third auxiliary could very easily just be a sled pull. And again, it doesn't be anything crazy. Even though it's a Monday, keep in mind, deload and reload. We're just trying to move some weight and stay active. I know it sounds horrible and it sounds downplaying, stay active, but you are. You are, because even if you are just staying active, if you're pulling a sled, you are still developing a base of strength. You are still, if you're doing it correctly, targeting your posterior chain. So again, if we're talking about targeting our posterior chain, we're upright, reaching out with our heels, stiff knee, using the hip as the sole mover, pulling that heel back like a match, squeezing your glute. If we're worrying about quad development, especially VMO, lower quad, we're leaning into it on the balls of our feet, never letting the heels touch. After that, a lap or upper back, depending. And then an ab. Typically, it's going to be a standing ab. Broken record, I know. But that's just the way it is. We're in athletics, we're in powerlifting. Everything you do is going to be on your feet nine times out of ten. So why wouldn't you train your abs like that? Sleep that night. Tuesday, you go off. Wednesday, you come in. All right. Great deload session I saw. So, again, you're going to do one rep maxes on Monday and Wednesday, typically. If you were in that template, we've gone over, if athletes should do that, we've already done that. We've gone over powerlifters, the majority of them, not the guys and gals down at West Side, if the majority of them should be doing one rounds. But let's say they don't. Come in. I remember we had, we had a big venture down there, Travis, and there was there was one day, it was like, I'm just getting tired of doing one rounds. And it was one of the most aggressive bench sessions I've ever, uh, top five. I've ever watched in my life. Straight bar, six rep max. And it was the most brutal competition I think I've almost ever seen in there in the 10 years I was there on a bench day. It was so incredibly exciting. Everyone would get to the fifth rep and it would, everyone would start like booing or cheering depending on you know, what kind of money they had riding on that guy or gal on the bench. So just doing a six rep, getting that maximum weight off your hands, it's all relative, you're still getting a stimulus to progress, 
you're still building, but you're, you're pushing for reps. It's a different stimulus, but you are still building. So that would be a real easy way to do a de or deload, reload, max effort up. So that would be the primary. Again, go into your, go into your auxiliaries. Probably a bamboo bar. We get off the flat. If it was more of like, hey, I need a little bit more like the bottom type development, it would be a slight decline. If it was a little more, I need more shoulders or triceps, it would be a slight incline. Now I'm not saying a decline to a point where it's like a like opposite of like an extreme Roman chair. No, it's like 10, maybe 20 degrees decline. Nothing crazy. Just enough to take pressure off the shoulder and put a little more on the chest, a little more on the top end of the tricep, because decline, you're gonna add a little bit more weight because the range of motion is a little bit less. Incline, 10 to 20 degrees, nothing crazy. We wouldn't go 45. Not saying no one ever did, but the ones I've seen, when I've seen what translates the most, 10 to 20 degree incline. Again, now the, these reps, typically three sets. It's a bamboo bar on a deload deck, like 10 to 20 reps. You know, I don't really want to go over 20. That, you start to really get into dynamic. You go sub 10. You just hit something. I had to say maximal, but relatively maximal in terms of like effort and perceived exertion for six reps. You don't really need to go below 10. So somewhere between 10 and 20. So that'd be, you know, auxiliary one. Even though it's a repetition method, we would call it auxiliary one. We are deloading, reloading. Cut that volume back a little bit. After that, the tricep. You're probably going to stick to a cable. Just because it's, it's easy, you don't need to load weight on a bar, taking less time in the gym, just putting blood where you need to put it. Really big into spud straps, or you can get these like toe straps or Vulcan straps, just so when you put your hand in there, you just rest it, you don't have to death grip anything. Old, those old Nautilus machines, they had it, I mean, Arthur Jones had it right where you just have a, a L pad right here, and you can actually ninja chop it, so you're not crushing that flexor down that ties into your elbow. If you ever had that issue where your ulnar bone feels a little like sore and you stretch your tricep out and all of a sudden it goes away, a lot of that's because you're just death gripping so much. As soon as you begin to relax that, stretch the forearm out, the flexor out, and the tricep, it goes away. So you use a spud ink or a Vulcan strap, some type of strap so you just have your hands there nice and loosey so you can go through the motion and find where you're most comfortable. So that'd be your second auxiliary. Your third auxiliary. This could go either way. Some people like doing a shoulder. After doing a bamboo bar, as, as people say now, me personally, I don't know what that means, but me personally, if you've already hit that, if you've already hit stabilization of the shoulder, and you're going to hit him on the back end of the week anyway with, with volume, so I wouldn't even worry about it, I would just go right to a, a ladder up or back. All right? After that, some type of ab. That ab could be really anything. Now, caveat on the triceps and the lap upper back work on a Wednesday. This could very easily be a great time to put in sled work for both those. Very, very easy. Very little weight change. Although, if you have time to put weight on a sled, you have the ability. Here in the, in the upper north, the cold north, we're heading into that season where you really can't go outside. If you can, it starts to get a little dicey. Where is it really worth having an athlete go outside or a lifter go outside? For an athlete, if they if they practice and play outside, I would usher them in that direction. For a power lifter whose game really isn't in the elements, it, it's it's not necessary unless they feel really hardcore. But that's a really great opportunity to put sled in for both the tricep and the lat upper back, and that can be very easy just like taking a plate off or putting a plate on for both the triceps upper back or upper back to triceps what have you. So sleep that night. Thursday's off, coming on Friday. Friday, completely up to you. I, I have seen Good Mornings doubled over, and when they've been doubled over, it had, when I say doubled over, they've done on Monday, they're gonna do it again on Friday. Friday, Bobar with Jerry Bands. Jerry Band, Jerry McNamara came up with this idea. Strongest little dude I've ever seen in my life. Bands go down at a 45, pulling you forward, so you're having to actively hinge back and actively push your back into that bar, which is typically an issue for athletes anyway. So they would something of that nature. Now for three to five sets of 20 reps, you know, keeping three to five reps in the tank. Because you're doing that hinge pattern, if you choose to do it that day, you're not doing a deadlift. You're not doing a deadlift. After that, because it's the end of the week and you're having multiple days now of rest, accumulating, still eating, still sleeping, managing your stress, hydrating. After that, we can probably go into 
a, a squatting pattern on the belt squat. On, off a box, typically, just to, just to eliminate time under tension and just to work on power. Now, with that, you could do something very simple. You could do 12 by 2 off that belt squat box squat. I've also seen that belt squat box squat bumped up to the front and then the good mornings bumped after it. So these can be interchanged depending on what the athlete or lifter is lagging in. So one of them will be a primary, one of them will be the auxiliary. All right, if you are concerned with power, do that belt squat work first. We've gone over in all the videos, straight weight versus band on the carriage. You look back and see that. If you're worried about power, do that first. If you're worried about strength and endurance, I would do the good mornings first. All right, because you are doing a belt squat, there's no, there's no upper back loading, you can get away with that volume on the back end with the good mornings. So one of those is the auxiliary one. Auxiliary two, start getting back into some hard hitting auxiliaries. So I'm reverse hypers. I would actually tend to go a little bit lighter, and I would go for about three to four sets of 50 to 75 reps in a row. Lightweight, all based on contraction. I know a lot of people out there, I've seen reps as low as 10 reps on a reverse hyper. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I am saying that. The biggest gains I have ever seen on a reverse hyper, you must get 30 reps in a row. You must get 30 reps in a row. I'm not saying that doing third, less than 30 won't work. It absolutely will. If it's working for you or your athletes, you need to do that. Don't just break off. You're in like week four of six of doing a certain amount of reps. And because I'm saying you have to do 30, you break off and you go to 30. Don't do that. That will only disrupt what you're doing. Run that. Run that till it breaks, preferably two weeks before it breaks. So anywhere from that higher rep range at 50 to 75 reps. I don't know what the weight on the carriage could be. I can throw out any gym can throw out, any coach can throw out a percentage or an amount and say, this is how much you should go on the reverse hyper carriage. Same, same, uh, no, same, same. You've all seen banded charts, how much band tension. All band charts lie. They all lie. They're not telling you the truth. The only way to really know is to actually put the band on to a suitcase scale and measure it. I digress. I get, I get questions about that all the time, how much band tension. So, after that auxiliary, then you go into like more of a hard hitting hamstring. So instead of like a banded, let's do an inverse curl. Okay, anyway, from three to five sets. At this point, I would probably pyramid up or pyramid down. Now, if you've never done a pyramid scheme, we're not talking about Ponzi, we're talking about going on the first one, like five reps, first set, second set, 10 reps, third set, 15 reps, fourth set, 20 reps, fifth set, 25 reps, or vice versa, 25, 20, 15, 10, five. Working way up or down. It just adds a little bit of a challenge, something new, not just you know, three sets of 10 to 15. Give them a challenge, give them a little spice in their life. All right? So that would be the auxiliary. And then after that final, very easily, upper back lat and an ab. Sleep that night, come in the next day, dynamic upper, Really just try to keep that purely to bamboo bar. I, I literally just make that the bamboo bar day. It's bamboo bar party. Great tool. Everything you do. So cut the dynamic bench out, repetition method out, all that. Eliminate what you think that Saturday looks like. All right? Bamboo bar bench from three sets of 30 reps. After that, bamboo bar Shoulder press, three sets, 30 reps. After that, bamboo bar skull crusher, three sets, 30 reps. After that, bamboo bar biceps, three sets, 30 reps. Get done with that. Bamboo bar rows. Typically, we do them standing on a bench, really hinging forward, almost like a golden era type row. We look at Arnold Schwarzenegger where Yes, his spine, his thoracic is actually curved, but such a lightweight, nothing's, it's, it's not gonna happen. Everything's gonna be fine. I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling you to do it. If you knew something's bad with your athlete, and if they let their, their back go, something's gonna happen. I never said to do that. But if your abs are engaged, it's a light enough weight, something of that nature. All right, so three sets, 30 reps. After that, biceps, three sets, 30 reps. You'll notice everything's three by 30. You're just, you're just flushing everything out at this point. 
Just flush everything out, give them a good pump, give them a good feel, give them a sweat, keep the, keep the time low, tell them you have an hour, you know, an hour, an hour and 10, an hour and 15 to get through this. Weight does not matter, motion and contraction matters. Get them in, get them out, because they sleep that night, they rest all Sunday, Monday they come in, and we're starting all over again. If you're in the classic system, you're doing a one rep max, you're going. If you're in more of like an athlete or a building system, you're not working with like incredibly advanced powerlifters or athletes, you're, you're building. You're doing like three, six rep top sets, in my opinion. So that's way one. That was just way one. So way two is a strongman type approach. Very popular, I really like it. I really like this approach. And for sake of simplicity, we're gonna say the majority or all of the auxiliaries that I've already listed when it comes to just the, that good morning week, that classical west side week, are the same. And let's just talk about the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday primaries. So, the Monday primary, so that sounds broken, but it would be a sled pull, it could be a yoke carry. Typically I say with a zercher carry, I, I, I would actually put it on the upper back. Even though we are getting that compressional load, it's gonna be heavily dictated by the abdominal control. So once they can't hold the dead bug brace, they're going through. As a coach, you see it, you cut it. Because once they lose that control of the brace, it's going all over the spine. That's no bueno. That's what, what my Yiddish friends call it, niche keep. All right, no good. All right, so we do that. Now, if we're talking about a sled, as we've already gone over, if they need leg drive, if they're having a problem at the bottom of a sumo, bottom of a deadlift, right? We are talking about balls of the foot leaning forward. Think of a strongman pulling at 747. If they were to wear a strongman harness on this kind of week, have at it. Have at it. Everything's relative. I would keep it to a one-way trip. So typically here at the west side barbell trip, 60 meters, give or take, that's actually 60 down and immediately 60 back, 120 total, give or take. Now, we stop and turn around because that, incur that, that actually makes the athlete or lifter stop and have to re-engage from nothing. So you get that start-stop component. Just going one way, because you're trying to simplify, deload, reload, I think it's a much better scenario. If you're worrying about coming out of the squat or locking out a deadlift, upright, reaching out with the heel, broken record, I know, stiff knee, all the motion comes from the hips, pulling that heel back like a match, squeezing your glutes, using your arms to propel you forward. That one I really keep to a belt around the waist. We go up top, they're just going to start leaning in and in. It's going to become a VMO quad dominant on the balls of the feet eventually, if not flat footed. So, one way. Could be 60 meters. Could be 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 15, 25, 35. It's really up to you. Just, just one way. And when you see the passion in their face, not they fail, but they, they start being like, you start like, grinding things out, like, yeah, it looks like they're getting like, nasty with it, cut it, it's over. They're straining, you've introduced a strain. Cut it, move on. Not necessary, move on. You're just trying to introduce adaptation, we'll keep everything low, move on. So, let's say all auxiliaries are the same, because that's what they're gonna be, give or take. Sleep that night, Tuesday off, Wednesday they come in. All right, do they lack more in the posterior chain? or anterior chain. Typically, typically it's gonna be more of a posterior chain lag. So, have fun with this. Again, let's do it a sled motion. All right, again, sled motion, it's, it's all concentric work, give or take. If you're controlling it, you're gonna get some negative, but the source is gonna be very, very minimal. So tax on system is just really about power, and just getting pump in there, and getting repetition, time under tension. Everything's relative. So find your favorite attachment or attachment that would complement what they need. So if they need more of a, a thoracic to low lat, I'm really big into like the prime rotating grips. If they are, make sure they are at least semi supinated. If you go full supination, they're gonna start bicep rowing it. Just keep them semi. To really dictate this, and hold them in that semi pronated row for thoracic to low lat, it's very easy to get a mag grip, M-A-G, so maximum advantage grips, it's actually coming here in Ohio. These, these grips are very, very big in the bodybuilding world. It's virtually the same type of grip as the prime rotate handles, but they're fixed. And you can get close supinate, you can get a moderate supinate, you can get the wide and actually flip it upside down and get a supinate, depending on whether you need to be 
If they need upper back, moderate pronate. It's make sure the entire time their shoulders are depressed down, a lot of pinky pressure, and as they drive back, they start to pour that thumb into their shoulder as they drop their shoulder further down in. So, one trip, same as Monday, 60, 50, 40, you know the drill. You know, get to a point you see passion on their face, cut it. That number, while it matters, what's on the sled, it doesn't matter. Because again, we're just trying to maintain and maybe gain. Maybe with all this repetition they're getting, they're starting to learn little tricks about their body of how to actually activate. You can actually coach, and if they're doing, pulling this number out of nowhere, 25 rows in 60 meters, you have 25 opportunities to adjust them. That's not even counting how many trips they do. So if they do four trips, leading up to that, that fourth trip, which is just that passionate face, you cut them, that's 100 opportunities reps to adjust and for them to learn so they can actually learn their body, all right? And if that observes, then we got the same, all right? So sleep that night, Thursday, rest, Friday, come in. It's gonna be a sled. However, we've just done a sled. So let's, let's, let's keep it a little changing. This is where another strongman tool comes in. A wheelbarrow, all right? A wheelbarrow or, and or, but let's, let's say or for now. A prowler, all right? If they need more of a leg drive component, use the prowler. Use the 100%. And I would go for trips. Controlled trips, not sprinting. We're not trying to get them to a point where they're activating a sympathetic nervous system. They're pulling a lot of oxygen through their mouth. Have them shut the mouth. Pure nasal breathing. This will keep them in third gear. All right, on a Friday and Saturday, we don't want them overdriving. We don't want them in fourth, fifth gear. We don't want them hitting a nitrous tank. We don't want them taking a snort of cocaine. Just keep them in third gear. It's all nasal breathing. So anywhere from six to up to 20 trips. I said 20, yes, yeah, six to 20 trips of a prowler. And that's usually at that point, depending on how in condition they are, dictated by them or coming to 90%, or if you know they're kind of like slack dogging, you keep a clock on. Right, and that clock can be regulated by what you're seeing in their face or by a sentence test. Now, if they are lacking more of a, let's say, stability aspect, this is to do where a lot of athletes come in, I would 100% go with a wheelbarrow. Handle each cart out in front, pushing forward, maybe turning around, grabbing it, going opposite on the way back, depending on what you want. You can do continual trips, or just going around, around, around here. We have about 465 meter building. We can go around. You can just do 100 meter trips, down and back, or just one way rest. However you want to do it, but that's really going to encourage them to again, like the, like the like the strongman work with the yoke, lock their abs down, and they're going to learn their ab position really quick. And you can use straps so they're not overdriving their grip. Pure nasal breathing at that point as well. After that, auxiliaries, and depending on what they're doing, much like the, the west side one we went over, that bow bar front good morning, or belt squat, squatting, 12 doubles. Again, if you're noticing that they need more power, do that, belt squat, 12 doubles, or however, wherever reps are gonna be, three or less, before the wheelbarrow. If you notice they need more strength and endurance, have them do the wheelbarrow first. It's all dictated by what you are seeing, what your athletes need, what your lifters need. I'm not saying nothing is written in stone. It's all based off what you're seeing. I'm just giving you ideas and tools. All right? Saturday you come in. I would honestly say just what the West Side one was, where it's a pure bamboo bar party. Anything. If you're doing with athletics, I would probably start with more of a shoulder press versus a bench or at least a 70 degree incline, so we're not really putting everything directly over and stacking, we're, about, we're a little more out with our back supported so we can hit a little bit more of a tie-in without putting a lot of stress on the actual rotator cuff and actually stretching it and opening it. Everything's saying three by 30. So that would be the strongman sled version. This is a great version because the majority of the work they're going to be doing, especially on that primary lift or auxiliary, however you want to define it, is at least 75% concentric. And it's going to contribute a lot more to base building. It's going to contribute a lot more to athleticism and stability, which whether you're doing with athletes or lifters, as a lifter, you need to be 
incredibly stable to walk out 600 pounds plus out of the rack. Or if you're in gear lifting, you need to know where you are in space really well when you're squatting over a gram. Because that can go wrong real quick. I've watched knees, I've literally watched a knee explode on stage, open and explode through a knee wrap. You need to know where you are in space. Gear lifting is not a joke. Now, the third way, this is a way I, I used a lot with competitive crossfitters. And it really depended on, or depends on rather, excuse me, the time of the year they're in. Using Olympic lifting as a deload or reload. Bear with me here. So, if you have an athlete, and let's just say we're not talking about CrossFit anymore, even though I just brought that up. And they can deadlift, let's go, let's go wild, why not, shall we? They can deadlift six plates, conventional, delicious. That's great. Does it translate over to the field? I hope so, it should. That's, we've already covered that. They can do that, but they can only clean, or power clean, let's say power clean, they're not even dropping into a full clean, they can power clean, so catching above the hip crease, 315. On the whole, I'm gonna go ahead and say that the power clean at 315 is causing less neurological stress than a max one rep deadlift at six plates. Now, it's all relative, I understand that. What if, instead of doing three plates, you know you can do it? Let's have them do 250. You know, or just two plates, it's 225. And just have them do it for six doubles. Very manageable. However, here's, here's the interesting part of using Olympic lifts for deload, reload. Because it is so submaximal weight from the floor, What's really taxing them, or mentally giving them confusion or stress or adaptation, is the is the motion they're having to go through. Is a technical aspect having to go through. It's you, the coach, if you are proficient in Olympic lifting. Please do not do this if you don't understand the fundamentals of Olympic lifting. That could be really bad. To be fair, they're learning a whole new aspect of how to move with submaximal weights, which are Maximal to an extent, but the extent is their lack of or not knowing the technique to execute that lift. So in this, we can actually get a neurological adaptation. We can get them to lock in and attack something new while not overdriving their nervous system. So if all auxiliaries were the same from that West Side template, from that Strongman template, the primaries could be actually really fun. It could be that, let's say, you know, six doubles at 225, or whatever weight they're doing. You know, some females can't do 225. So that could be like 135 for females, 225 for males. Just pull those numbers out. I, you know, you got to judge that for yourself. You could do that and go through all those auxiliaries. Monday, you, Monday night you sleep, Tuesday you rest, Wednesday you come in. Okay, Olympically, what is the press? It is the the punch through in either in a snatch position or in a jerk position. Well, let's have them do a split jerk. If they can, they can split jerk as a max. Okay, we'll say three. We'll say three plates. Three plates, and you have them do. Let's say to work down on sheer four on the sheer on the shoulders and especially the elbows. Let's have them do six singles at two twenty five and just hone it in each time a little bit more. The weight is sub maximal. But neurologically, it is to an extent maximal that the technique is not there. So you can actually, again, just like Monday, get them to adapt and to learn that technique and that position of that jerk position. So, great idea. And after that, auxiliary is pretty much the same. Honestly, pretty much the same. You sleep that night, Thursday off, you come in on Friday. Again, we've gone over this, you know, that belt squat, I do like that to a box if they need more explosiveness versus strength. You know, stronger than fast, faster than strong. We've gone over that in the previous video. Definitely do that first or second based on, staying with the Olympic theme, let's do like a, an overhead squat variation. Now, I know that it's very popular and uh, bougie, if you will, in the world of FRC and 
and you know functional movement systems and all that all that jazz to use an overhead squat to dictate and see where people are tight, where they're lagging. So great opportunity as a coach to see, all right, they can only get about halfway down, their shoulders start getting in. All right, I need to moving forward, work on more shoulder mobility, upper back mobility, maybe triceps are too tight. Maybe the rear delt, you know, me, the front delts impinged. That gives you a really good idea heading into the next however many months of your micro meso cycle, wave cycle, whatever you know, whatever cool term you're using, gives you a really good idea of what I need to work on before and after the session to open that up so they can actually receive. If their their hips are tight, you can elevate your heel, and that gives you a good indication, hey, your groins, your hip is tight or it's impinged. That's what I need to work on. Heading into the next. Any set or rep scheme will do. I would stay sub five reps. So simplicity sake, let's say a five by five, everyone loves a five by five. A five by five and an overhead squat, a snatch, or if they are mobile in a jerk position. All right, much like how the Chinese catch a jerk, you know, squat jerk. All right, then after that, still sticking with that box squat, or before that in the box squat again, based on what they need. All right, auxiliary is still the same. They sleep the night, come in the next day. It's the exact same thing as the last two. I would 110%. Stick with bamboo bar party. A bamboo bar party. The only difference is, in this Olympic type of deload reload week, I would start it with, instead of a bench press, instead of a 70 degree incline press for the strongman, I would start it with an overhead, either a jerk or a snatch position, based off of what we saw, what you saw, the athlete or lifter lagging just the day before, when they did overhead squats, so if they're, you, they have them in jerk, they were really bad at jerk, keep them there. If they were bad at snatch and you have them in snatch, keep them there. Have them do one to three trips, not consecutive. So if you're doing like two or three, rest 90% between around a building. So when I say around a building, excuse me, I'm saying that 400, like, it's like 60, 65 meters here at the industry in Westside. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun trip, if you will. Holding that bamboo bar overhead. Start low, start with the smallest kettlebell, and then each time work your way up a little bit. Maybe not necessarily in kettlebell, but in additional weight. Remember, it's always best to have maybe two five pound kettlebells each side, then one ten. We're going for oscillation. We're not really going for linear bounce. And then after that, everything the same as we've already listed. So, again, the classical west side barbell conjugate. Deload, total clickbait, there really is no deload. You're always working. Because if you can continually work and get better, why wouldn't you do that? One of the worst things you can possibly do, have your athletes do, is take a complete week of absolutely nothing. Not saying that's not warranted. Not saying it's not warranted. I've seen people that go through hell in competition and they need a week or two of next to nothing or just walking the dog. However, if you're talking about just doing three, six, nine, twelve, however many pushes or cycles or micro mesos and they need some time, 100% give any of these a shot. Again, they're all in the description. Go down below. If you have any questions, comment. I'll be in there. If you can't find me there, direct message me at Special Strengths. Until next time, ciao for now.